Amen. We serve a wonderful God today. Lord, we honor you and we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for your presence, Lord. Thank you for your work in our lives, Lord. It, it's through you that we have testimonies, that we have miracles, Lord. We honor you and thank you today, Lord, for your presence, Lord. You are worthy. You're worthy of the honor. If you've come today into the house, God is here to touch you and to meet your needs. If you have a need today, would you just raise your hand and say, I have a need. Now, there's something I'm praying about. If there is something in particular that that you really want to, the pastor and the prayer warriors to agree with you on, they're going to come this morning. And if there's something that you're going through, something that you need today, God is here and he is going to meet you right here in this altar. He's going to touch your life and meet your needs. If that's you today, please come forward and we're going to take time and we're going to approach the throne. We're going to approach God. He's here today in the house. Then we're going to remember all these needs. We're going to ask God to move this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we honor you today. Lord, we're reminded of how awesome and how wonderful you are. Lord, how glorious and how precious you are. Lord, we honor you today and thank you, Lord. We thank you for all the power and all the ability, Lord, that you have. Lord, that you can reach far beyond anything that we could hope or imagine. Lord, anything that a doctor would say, anything that a situation would call for. Lord, you're outside of those things. Lord, you're amazing. You're wonderful. Lord, we pray that your miracle-working power, the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, would be here today, Lord, in this house. Lord, as we've come together, Lord, agreeing, Lord, in your name, Lord, that you would touch and that you would move. Lord, we pray that you would sweep over this house, Lord, every heavy heart here today, every need, every request that's been mentioned. Lord, we pray that you would move in this house, Lord. We pray that you would move financially and pray that you would move physically and touch those that are sick and those that are hurting today, Lord. We pray that you would have your way, Lord, in this house. Lord, that you would be glorified and honored. Lord, bring healing to all those, Lord, that have raised their hand today, Lord, and touch those that have come forward. Lord, we pray that especially, Lord, that you would bless them and minister to the need that they have, Lord, and that you would work a work in their life, Lord. There would be a miracle that would go on forever. And Lord, we pray today, Lord, as the men are out on encounter, we pray that you would just touch and move, Lord, and you would continue the work, Lord, that you're doing out there, Lord, to renovate hearts and to change lives Lord we give you praise we give you honor today Lord we give you all the glory and all the thanks Lord we honor you today Lord it's you that does the work Lord Lord we just pray that you would touch over this house Lord minister to every heart and every need Lord even in situations maybe where where people didn't raise their hand or where people just didn't remember to mention it. Lord, I pray that you would do something special, Lord, in people's lives today. Lord, let them know, let them be reminded, Lord, of your love and how much you care, Lord, and move in this house, Lord, in a wonderful, amazing way. Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for, for listening. Lord, we thank you for hearing our requests. Lord, and we honor you and praise you today, Lord. Lord, we magnify you and glorify you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we dedicate this day to you, this time. Lord, everything that we spend, Lord, all of our energies, Lord, is to honor you and to glorify you and to praise you, Lord. You're wonderful, Lord. We bless you and we love you and we thank you today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. We honor you. We bless you. If you would, let's praise the Lord for a second for hearing our prayers. Lord, we honor you and thank you, Lord, for listening. Lord, we're blessed. The Bible says that he's an ever-present help in the time of trouble, and that is so true and so wonderful. God is so amazing and so awesome. You may be seated. If our ushers would come forward, we're, we're going into our offering time. We would just remind you today that as you do give in the offering, the, the loose offering, it will go to the mission field and the missionaries that we sponsor and the projects that we sponsor here at Stratford Heights. We'd also want to remind you, that if you have not yet, we'd ask you to prayerfully consider uh, your pledge to the new building. We are going full force ahead, and we're having a, a wonderful time. and It's an exciting time, and uh, if you will take care of business, that would be awesome. But we, we, uh, we appreciate it so much, and we are excited about the ministry that is coming to our church. It's wonderful to, to see all the miracles and the great things that God is doing. 
But anyhow, let's pray over the offering and let's just let God have his way. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you today, Lord, and we honor you, your name. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give. Lord, we understand and recognize, Lord, that it's, it's all you. It's all your provision. It's all your blessings. So, Lord, we give back today, Lord, in honor and, and, and praise and worship to you. Lord, we give our offerings and our tithes, Lord, as, as praise and honor to your name. And Lord, we pray that your blessings would be upon this house, Lord, and that your blessings, Lord, would work and move in the future of this church, Lord, and that we dedicate everything that we are to you and pray that you would touch our missionaries, the new building project, and just pray that you would have your way today in this house, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I read a statistic the other day that said if you got change in a little cup at home, if you've got enough money to buy milk this week at the grocery store, then you are in the top 3% of the most wealthiest people on the face of the earth. How many would sing again, I am blessed? I am blessed. I was watching television this morning, and seeing different reports around the world. Just, it just seemed like every report was just showing the poverty. It was all over the whole world. And I looked out at the woods. It's not big woods. It's probably no bigger than about four of those pews. It's woods behind my house. And I looked out this morning and I said, Lord, you have blessed me with so much. We are blessed this morning. And what a beautiful Sunday to be together on Palm Sunday, the Holy Week. As we get ready to look at the passion of Christ all week long. I hope every day you'll be looking into the Word of God. And you'll be just marching through the whole scene as we replay. Almost like, you know, Jesus said, as often as you do this, talking about communion. He said, do it in remembrance of me. I kind of take this entire week to be communion. Now you say, well, what does that mean in your life? Well, what it means in my life is that there are things I'm just, that I would just casually do. That, for instance, I really cut back on Diet Coke this week. I don't watch TV this week. I'll watch maybe one morning. I'll watch the news you know, for a little bit, but that'll be all just to keep up with the world. But I won't watch TV as my entertainment. All what you say, well, are we supposed to do this? No. It's just this week I'm wanting to make I'm wanting to make decisions and I'm wanting to take the week, Sister Brenda, to be holy and to set apart myself for the week that Christ gave his everything for me. When I think about what I'm going to speak on today and I think about how he looked over the hill in Jerusalem as he was heading towards that city knowing right well what lied, what was coming, then I think about how blessed I am and I think about what I owe him when it comes to living a sacrificed life. And I just, I tell you, I'm, I'm in honor of all that God has done to prove his love. I've read all the other gods. I've looked at all the other philosophies and other religions. And you know, when you just lay the facts all out, I like ours even better than theirs. I like God, the real God, better than any concoction or made up philosophy that they've come up with Jesus Christ coming to earth dying on the cross for me that is the greatest love story ever written a God who loves his people before we read the text this morning I would ask you if you would to just in your own heart the Bible says lift up holy hands unto the Lord would you just write where you are if you feel comfortable just lift your hands to the Lord in honor his presence as we begin a week of looking back looking at what he did for us a communion of our life communion of our heart as we honor him and bless his name jesus christ we honor you son of god son of david son of man we honor you today lord we thank you for all that you've done for us how that you've cleaned us up lord you set us on a narrow path of righteousness leading towards eternal life as a gift from you because you love your people thank you so much for all that you've done for us we honor you today we honor you lord throughout the year with all of our life in the mighty mighty name of jesus christ we pray amen as we 
read the scripture and ask you to turn to Luke chapter 19, verse 28. I've been in church over the weekend. Last weekend, we had our ladies encounter. And yesterday, I popped out over at the encounter. I was going to just stay for about an hour. And I ended up staying until 1 o'clock this morning. <laughs> Could not leave. And pardon me for being emotional. Could not leave. Saw young men and old men alike with their hands up in the air, praying for one another. The power of the Lord. People nailing things to a cross and you'd hear it in the background and everyone would begin to clap all over the place. It was just the most beautiful atmosphere I've ever been in. I tell you, the presence of the Lord was so thick. You cannot spend 48 hours with God and there not be something amazing going on and boy the presence of the Lord I can't hardly wait for tonight they'll be here tonight and they'll they'll be uh, in the service testifying and singing I understand they're going to fill the choir loft every time I turn around I see that bald spot drives me crazy if y'all know what to do about that let me know oh brother Mix no <laughs> God is surely with our men out there, many of them saved that came on the trip, and many of them sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. Last night I was privileged to be around, I think, 10 to 12 guys who were filled with the Holy Ghost, and the Lord has just blessed them. They'll, they'll be on fire tonight, that's for sure, so you'll want to be here in service. But also when we pray, we're going to pray for John Oak's family. His mother passed away this week. His funeral was, her funeral was on Saturday. So we want to pray for him and also little Alexis Carmike. Little Alexis is the little girl that had the surgery uh, that we prayed for about a year ago, a year and a half ago. She was in ICU for close to six months, brand new baby. She's been out for a year doing well, but she is back in the hospital this morning. She's got pneumonia. So we want to pray for little Alexis and uh, let's lift her up. I want to thank Green Pro Landscaping also. Did you see how pretty the church looked when you came in today? Who noticed? Anybody notice? Oh, everybody. Very good. Very good. I really appreciate them. They had a whole crew of guys out here to, to do that and make it look beautiful free of charge. I said, we, we, want, to, we want to get the mulch and we'll pay for it and we'll do this. And, and they just come and did it. So I appreciate that. People love God and love his house. We want to... Read our text this morning from Luke chapter 19. I've entitled the message this morning, Jesus wept. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, talking about Jesus, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying, go ye into the village over against you. In the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never a man has ever sat. Loose him and bring him hither, bring him to me. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that went, and they that were sent, went their way and found, even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? They said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they sat Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, 
because thou knewest not because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation let's pray father we pray this morning and first of all we lift up little alexis to you ask you to touch this little child this little girl father you've had your hand on her and you've been there for her we believe that you're there for her this morning be with sarah and bobby her mom and dad and god touch them let the work of god be accomplished use doctors use nurses but lord let your work be accomplished bring healing and strength and life to this little child and lord we ask you to comfort and strengthen the oaks family as they deal with the loss of their mom touch them today let your comfort and peace be theirs and lord we ask you to touch the word of god speak to us father by your holy spirit may all of this hour be so vital and essential to our own eternal difference and i ask this in the name of jesus christ and we give you honor and praise amen you may be seated it was a familiar bible story and how how wonderful to be able to preach in this set this is uh, uh kind of brings it all home helps you to get a feel for for where we are and, and what we're looking at this week. I tell you, this is one of the, you know, it, it's one of the most tragic weeks in all of Christianity because you deal with the fact, you know, I had a lot of folks that say Christians can put their head in the sand and don't realize, man, they're talking about a, a pretty violent week, a very bloody week. And I understand that, and I do think about that. I've watched The Passion of the Christ, which is one of the, the only human depictions I've ever seen that even comes close to perhaps describing in detail what happened to the Savior. The God who loved the whole world so much that he literally left the throne, the glories of the worship that was his, the angels that stood around, the, the paradise of heaven. We live to go to heaven. We live to make sure our lives are ready and we're sanctified and we're in a place of acceptable service for the Lord when he comes. We long to hear well done, thou good and faithful servant. We long to go there. And Jesus loved us enough to leave it. Jesus loved us enough to leave it. That in and of itself speaks volumes to me about the love of God. It's not just his creation that he wanted to preserve. It was love. The Bible says, no greater loveth any man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ loves you and I. And in this particular story, this very familiar Bible story, we, we made reference to today being Palm Sunday. They refer to Palm Sunday because this was the day that the, the folks around Jerusalem honored Jesus Christ as he came into the city as a king no other time in his visitation to the earth had they done that this was monumental this was an important time in the history as a matter of fact many scholars believe it to be very detrimental that it was actually prophesied to the very day that he would come into the city as he did on a colt and that he would be honored as king and they would lay their palm branches it was tradition that the palm branches were only used when they were celebration of victories over wars and for gladiators and for warrior type folks and for kings. And here the tradition was being given to Jesus as he came into the city. And as we look back on this monumental day, this awesome, awesome day, we see that Jesus had very specific instructions. Everything was outlined in such a way that we would understand and know that it was, not, it was not just happenstance. It was not just coincidence. Everything that took place cleared out to the fact that we find in Luke chapter 9 where Jesus literally looked at the disciples and it said he, he told them it was time for him to be offered up and it was time for them to head towards Jerusalem. So they literally started their hundreds of miles journeys he had hundreds of miles he had covered the Sea of Galilee. He had been all around Jerusalem. He had been all down through the villages. He had walked everywhere that he went. There was no camel procession. There was no other animals ever mentioned in the Bible. He walked everywhere he went. But on this particular day in Luke chapter 19, we find that Jesus stops them 
as they get close to the city, as he comes over and around the Mount of Olives, and he understands he's getting close. He had already been working his way, and all along the way there were miracles. And if you remember correctly, he had even gotten to the place where he stopped in Bethany, and there he raised Lazarus from the dead. So rumors and all of the, the news had literally flown all over the, the villages everywhere. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. So there were lots of folks showing up. Not only was it also the time of the Passover in Jerusalem, so there were lots of folks heading to Jerusalem anyway, lots of tourist events, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of trinkets for sale, all kinds of things. As million people probably just invaded the city of Jerusalem and there in that precise moment, in that hour, knowing a couple of months ahead, as the Bible says in Luke chapter 9, he was... He set himself steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. And he worked his way down through every village until they got to this place where he's standing, he's standing at the Mount of Olives. And there at the Mount of Olives, Jesus looks, looks out over the distance and he knows that the gates of the city of Jerusalem is coming and he understands and he knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he says something interesting. He looks at two of his disciples and he says, go to the next village over there across the way. You'll find right inside the gate there a colt, a young colt tied that has never been ridden by another man. Loose her and bring her to me. And he said, if anyone asks you why you're loosing this colt, you tell them the Lord needs him. And I tell you, that's a message in and of itself. That's another whole day. You'll hear it. I'll get up and I'll announce the message title for this morning, the Lord needs it. But on that particular day, Jesus knowing well what he was doing, sends them forward and we know from the scripture that they go into the town they, they go into the village there they find the colt right there the owner of the colt says hey why are you loosing the colt and we don't understand whether it was something prearranged we don't understand except that perhaps i believe the spirit of the lord had already prepared the man perhaps we don't even know what the word doesn't tell us what happened but I know this, it wasn't a coincidence and the guy wasn't just ignorant. He literally, when they, when they gave him the precise words, when Jesus told him exactly what to say, when to ask you, here's what you say. The Lord hath need of him. When they said that, whatever it was, it was the key word. And the owner said, my gift, go. Who knows, but what he woke up that morning with a dream. Who knows but what a prophet had already spoke to him. Who knows how the Lord did it. But the awesome thing to know is that God is always one step ahead of us. God is always one step ahead of you. That's important to know. He knows what's going on, not only in the world. He knows what's going on in your life and mine. We say, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder where God is. I tell you, he's never far away from you and he's always one step ahead and in this particular situation the Lord needs it and they brought the colt back to him down to the very hour Jesus was fulfilling prophecy as he then the the colt was brought to him and the disciples took their clothes some of their shirts and, and robes and laid it over top of the donkey and then they turned around and laid claws down in the road for him they were setting him up they were honoring him. they knew something was up they didn't understand everything they were a little puzzled as to what was really going on but they sensed and they knew that Jesus was on a mission they knew that Jesus was that he had an agenda that there was something going on that was unlike any other time for he had never wanted to ride anything anywhere they had always walked everywhere they went but now on this particular day this one time in the word Jesus has asked them to bring him a colt to ride on. Now we know from tradition and history that when a king or a great gladiator warrior would come into the town, 
The king, during times of war, would ride a, a stallion. A horse would come into town. That would declare, we're in war. We're going to be victorious. We're going to win. And I'm coming through. And the people would cheer. And they would just... You know, they would give their support and they would literally stand on the sides of the road and honor the king as he came through on the stallion declaring war. That same king in times of peace when the war was over would then come in to the city and through the gates and there he, was, he would be riding a colt, he would be riding a donkey and that symbolized to the people that peace had prevailed, that they had won and now all would be well and all would be calm. So it isn't surprising that Jesus, every other time he'd ever been, he'd always told folks, he'd say, now don't tell anybody what I've done. He'd heal folks and he'd say, tell no man, tell nobody. It wasn't his time. He was waiting for his time. When you look at this scripture, you understand Jesus is then declaring. He had already been working his way from one miracle to another up to this place, this hour, this time when he would be presenting himself as a king with a message Reminds me of the angels that sung from the hilltops overlooking Bethlehem when they said, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to all men. When Jesus came to declare his kingship to the earth, he didn't come riding the stallion. He didn't come in declaring war to the world. Jesus came in riding a colt. He came in as a king declaring that peace was coming. Do you know that this morning? Peace was coming. That's what all this is about. That's what everything, every song you sing, everything that we do, everything that's connected to the Passion Week is all about Christ coming in peace to fulfill the mission to fulfill the heart of God Almighty. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Many folks thought that when the Messiah would come, he would set up his kingdom. He would set up like the throne of David. He would literally rule and reign over Jerusalem and set the Roman Empire on its feet and literally, and literally take over the government of the world. They were looking for a warrior king. They were looking for a king riding a stallion coming into town as the Messiah. But Jesus had a completely different purpose. He kept trying to get them to understand everywhere he went, every healing, every deliverance, everywhere that he went, he tried to get the message across to them. I've come, I've come to tell you about love. I've come to tell you to love your neighbor as yourself. I've come to tell you to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul. I've come to tell you to serve to wash your brother's feet. I've come to tell you to feed the hungry, visit the sick, go to the prisons, take care of the widows. I've come with a different message than you thought, perhaps, but it's the message that you need. God came and he so loved the world. That's what this week is all about. So much so that he gave himself, sacrificed his life, when I think about how much he loves us, it convicts me to live a holier life. I don't do it to get to heaven. I don't live separated from the things of this world because I want to make it in by the skin of my teeth. I don't stand over here on a line from the world and Christianity and, and sanctification and holy living and the world and try to see how close I can get to the line. I know so many folks that literally spend their lives debating what's wrong and what's okay. What can I do and what can I do? What's a sin and what's not a sin? Give me the list so I can live my life the way I want to. Sister Marsha, I live every day crucifying the flesh and getting to the place where I'm acceptable in his sight. And I, man, that's a hard battle. I know how hard it is to stay in a place. Man, none of us are born perfect. We live in a wicked world. We live in an evil world. We live in a time when it's when you got to get up and you got to make a decision every day that you're going to serve the Lord, that you're going to set yourself apart. 
I don't want to live as close to the line as I can. I want to see how far away I can get from it. I want to be acceptable. I want to hear those words. Sister Linda, I want to hear him say, well done, Ray. I live for that. I don't care. The church of God can give me a degree. They can, they can put me a plaque on the wall. They can, the state can tell us we're the, the, the greatest church in southern Ohio. They can do all that. And that would mean beans to me when it comes to what this mission of Christ and living godly is all about. I want to live in such a way that when I'm standing before him, when I'm on the line trying to get close enough, when the roll has been called and we're all standing there, the trumpet has been sounded and all of us are walking up past the tree of life and we see the beautiful sparkling river and the streets of solid transparent gold and we're looking around and we've already seen mama and we've seen grandma and grandpa and we've seen the prophets of old and we're working our way towards the throne and as we get up close there, Sister Thomas, I can't hardly wait until I get up to where he's at and when I get there, all I want to hear in the whole world i'm not looking for any accolades or rewards all i want to hear him say is well done ray good and faithful servant I've, you're enter now into the joys of the lord you've been faithful that's what i want him to say to me do you want that is that your hunger and your cry that's what it's all about that's what real christianity is all about it's living in such a way that you find yourself acceptable when you stand there before him that's what it's all about Everything else gets us off track. Everything else causes us to stumble. Everything else gets our eyes on things on this world. It's only the right heart and the right mind kept focused on Christ Jesus that leads us into that way everlasting. The Bible says a narrow path and few there be that find it. It's not easy. I tell folks a lot of times, serving Christ, it's not for it's not for the weak. It's not for the weak. It's not for the wimps. The world will tell you that it is. It's weak-minded folks who accept Christ. It's weak folks that, that can't, can't live the life out there in the hard, real world. It takes a real man and a real woman of character and integrity and strength to be able to accept Christ and to go against the grain in this world. Every single day, the broad road to destruction is filled like a highway jammed like 75. And they're all headed towards destruction. Narrow is the path, the Bible says, and few there be that find it. Is it because he's made it so hard and difficult to find? No. Because so few are willing to stay there willing to walk it. It's so important. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul writing said, of whom I am chief. 1 John 3 and 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus has come to destroy the enemy's tactics and schemes, devices, traps, and lies. He's come. People say, well, why is, why is it so hard? Why is there so much difficulty? Why was there Calvary? Why was there a cross? Because God so loved the whole world that he wanted to make sure that when you stood before him, there'd be no excuse because, it's, see, it's not about God putting a list of to-dos in front of you and saying, are you good enough? Never has been, never will be. Folks talk about that all the time. They, well, I can't be like you Christians. I can't live that life. I can't do that. There's nothing in the Word of God that ever said you had to. When God looks at you and I and he looks into our life, he looks past us to the cross of Calvary. He looks to Jesus, his son, and he declares that he was good enough. And that's the gift that he gives to you and I. The gift of Christ. The gift of sins washed away, whiter than the driven snow. He washes us clean. 
He makes us brand new. The Bible says brand new creatures in Christ. That's the gift that's been given to us. The Bible talks about Revelation talks about the future and prophecy and Ezekiel and Daniel and all these books put things together to let us know kind of where we're headed and what's going on in the world. I'll tell you, we're really close right now. As surely as he came into that city that day, surely as Jesus came on the colt into that city of Jerusalem to pronounce his kingdom, his, his servanthood to the people, his love for the people, but yet his peace that he brings as king. There's coming another day when he will come again. And I'm telling you, the countdown is on. There are Bible scholars, and many from the 1800s even, that still hold true today. Ray Steadman writes this in his book. He says, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, we read about the prophecy of 70 weeks. It is generally understood that the prophecy talks about a special 490 years of Jewish history, which would begin to run its course when the command was given to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem following the Babylonian captivity. The Bible also points out that when 483 of those years had elapsed, there would be seven years there that that would be in the mix that would bring it all together. And when you start really adding up and looking at some of the calculations in Daniel, (coughs) you cannot believe it as you start to understand and see that this day, this hour, when Jesus was literally asking them, telling them to bring him that colt, he sits up on the colt and he literally parades himself down through the city as he approaches the gates to Jerusalem, according to many who believe in the prophetic words of Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation. On that day, literally, was exactly the day prophesied in the book of Daniel written hundreds of years earlier that he would present himself to the people. Isaiah said that he would come. He said, rejoice, O daughters of Zion, for your king, your Messiah, will come riding a colt. Literally the prophecies being fulfilled. And on that day, literally presented his king to the earth And then as we begin to understand the timeline, we know and we see that we are now at a very historical place in Scripture. I can't tell you the day or the hour, I wouldn't. Is it going to be 2012, Pastor? I don't know. But everything in the Word of God, all through Revelation and prophecies that are coming together, the way the world view is, the way Israel has come. Many folks many years ago in 1948 would have never dreamed, even to the day before it finally happened, they said Israel will never become a nation, and it did. The Bible has declared over and over and over again what would happen in the end times worldwide that no man could control. And we see it coming to life, page after page after page. Brother Rainey, it's hard living these days, but Jesus is coming. The King is coming. Rejoice, O daughters of Zion. Rejoice, for the Lord is coming. I'm telling you, you hear it now and you stand before the Lord and rejoice. And you'll see, I remember it was just a few Sundays ago when Pastor said the Lord was coming. I live for that hour and I live for that day. I know that he's coming soon. The scripture points to his soon coming, which only lets us know as God is working out every detail, clear down to Bethlehem, everywhere the scriptures unfold, the literal hundreds of prophecies throughout the word of God that all come true, page after page happening. We see all of this and it says something to us that we need to understand. God has a plan. And God is following his plan perfectly. Do not fear that your life is out of control. I feel so strong to say that again. Don't fear that your life is out of control. He has you. He has you in the palm of his hand. He knows you're going out and you're coming in. He knows what's happening in your life. He understands and there's no surprises. Isn't that comforting today? 
There are no surprises to God. There's nothing that comes to him by surprise. And that day, that hour, as he came down through that city, you see the crowds begin to gather and the word has spread ahead to Jerusalem. Everybody's excited. They're saying Jesus is the Messiah. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, I heard what he did over here in Bethphage. I heard what he did over here in another town. I've been listening. Have you heard what's been happening around the Sea of Galilee? I believe this is the Messiah. And surely, as the millions were gathering and the people were coming together in Jerusalem for the Passover, word was spreading quick. Jesus is coming, the Messiah. And as he was approaching the city, the Bible says that the crowds gathered and they got on every side of the road and they were already talking. And as I said, many of them were there. Tons of people were there. I, I can look back through history of the word and I just imagine as you think about who might have been standing there. When you look at the word and you understand some of these people that were there, they, there had to be folks that, that we had read about, people that we'd known. Jairus' daughter had, perhaps was standing off to the side somewhere with her palm branch. And you've probably got Lazarus and Mary and Martha standing over on the corner. They might have spied Jairus' daughter and they're in a special club of the Come Back to Life Club. And they're over here starting a new support group and they're all excited and they're standing over there saying, Jesus is coming to town. Well, I wouldn't even be here if he hadn't raised me from the dead. People that were healed, probably blind Bartimaeus standing off somewhere where he could get a good look because for the first time in years, he's seeing without any, any kind of having to feel and having to, the darkness is gone in his life. He's standing on the side of the road. No doubt Zacchaeus who'd paid all his bills, given everything he could to the poor and was a well-respected man now in the city after a bad few years of, of bad reputation is standing off to the side. Others saying, oh, Zacchaeus, it's good to see you good to see you and he'd say if it weren't for Jesus I wouldn't be here of course there were the sinister faces as well the people that were not happy the people that were testing and looking for him wanting to to see him mess up in some way I'm sure the Pharisees and the sad that you sees were standing close by watching a little upset as the people were worshiping this threatened them threatened their power and authority and control I'm sure there were even a few Roman soldiers standing by as well. A few Roman soldiers standing there wondering if they're going to have to keep the peace, if this crowd's going to get out of control, wonder if there's anything going to happen, any kind of rioting that'll take place that'll cause people to turn against Rome. They were watching closely with sword in hand. And then I think about the disciples coming down through town. What did they think? I kind of have a feeling Judas was probably the most happy. You say, why in the world? As you think about who he was and what he liked about life, man, here's all this notoriety, red carpet treatment. He's coming down through there like a celebrity. He's there throwing coins and he's collecting them, putting them in his bag. He's having himself the time of his life. He's like, I could get used to this. This is good. But see, in a few days, things were going to change drastically. They were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And as the crowd was gathering, Jesus, literally on his colt, as he comes down through the city, stops while they're waving their palm branches. And he just stares at the city. And no doubt, Jackie, he sees the temple over in the background. And he sees all the people lined up. He sees Lazarus. He sees Mary. He sees all of the folks standing close by. And it says, as he enters into the city, the parade is just cheering and everybody's happy. And the Bible says that suddenly it stops. And there, Jesus looking out over the city, looking at, into the faces of all the people. He knew. And the Bible said that he became very emotional. The Bible says he cried. The disciples looked at him and wondered, why? Why is he crying? When Jesus looks at the world and they wonder if God is nothing more than a genie in a bottle for them, he's nothing more than a warrior lord or a king or gladiator to get him out of trouble. He's a Republican or a Democrat. When people are looking, as they often do at the church, and looking, 
looking into the face of Jesus. Jesus wonders now the same thing he wondered then. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Here they all were worshiping. Here they were cheering. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How oft I would have gathered you to myself like a mother hen doth her chicks, but you would not. He knew. He knew that the cheers of Hosanna would just in a few days turn to crucify him. He knew. But the Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and loved us. You and I have been given the gift of a beautiful, beautiful Savior who loves us. Perhaps he weeps yet today Perhaps he looks into our faces and looks into our motives, our agendas, and weeps. When he looks into your life, your commitment, your sacrifices, your desire to live for him and to know him, to help fulfill his mission, what is his response to you? Would you stand with me this morning? He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And God had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every sin, every transgression, past, present, and future, God had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Fathers, we come before you this morning. We're thankful. We're thankful for the gift of your son. For we declare in this house, like the disciples did that afternoon, that evening, sitting by the fire when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter jumped up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We declare you are the Christ. We declare that you are the Messiah. We take our palm branches and, Lord, we honor you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We take our hearts and our lives, our bodies physically, our minds, we submit ourselves to you in honor this week, Lord. We remember what you've done. We remember the victories you've given to us as surely as there were many that afternoon, that day and that crowd that disappointed you, many that you knew would turn on you. Lord, there were those there faithful, those who had been through the fires and found you as their deliverance. God, perhaps the lepers were there and there was at least one of those lepers in the crowd that day with tears rolling down their eyes saying, he is the king. He is my king. And Lord, it was Bartimaeus who you could hear in the crowd saying, he's my king. May we be your people, sheep of your pasture. I pray for every heart and every life who is here today. As we begin this week, Lord, and we look, we remember, we prepare ourselves for Easter. I pray that you will touch us and our families. Help us this week. This week as we share and talk and Witness, God, to the saving power of Christ in our own lives. May we be vigilant, Lord, in pointing people to the cross. But not just to the cross, but to the resurrection. 
for the gift of eternal life that comes to us because you loved us so much. And Lord, should there be one that's here today that needs to know you as personal Lord and Savior, then I pray for them right now. I pray that you will touch their life and their heart and God, don't let them leave from this hour. Don't let them leave from this place because surely as on that very day, that very afternoon, you were fulfilling prophecy by presenting yourself on a colt to the city of Jerusalem. I believe, Lord, that this very hour in this house today in 2012, you have ordained this moment for some man, some woman who stands here in this place. If you are here today and you need Jesus, if you're here today and you need to acknowledge him and accept him into your life as Lord and Savior, we're going to pray a prayer. And as we do, I just ask you, would you just slip your hand up right where you are and then right back down? Amen. God bless you. Is there anyone else? I, I want to pray that prayer. I want to make sure that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Are you here this morning? Just quickly your hand up and then right back down we're going to pray a prayer thank you thank you for these that have lifted their hands Is anyone else anyone else this morning we're going to pray a prayer the prayer in and of itself is just words unless it comes from your heart if you mean it with everything in you then you're holding a palm branch of honor and glory to Hosanna the King if you mean it and you believe it and you confess this out loud, I'm telling you, your life is going to change. So I'd ask you, congregation, let's take these people to the throne this morning together. Would you pray this prayer with me? And if you lifted up your hand or if you didn't, but you need Jesus in your life, pray this prayer, mean it with all of your heart. And I'm telling you, it'll change your life. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I know you died for me. I know you rose from the dead for me. You've taken all of my sins and washed them away.